Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media and the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment, let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III, and you have made it to your on your way to your weekend edition of the Hamilton Corner. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. Uh, we've been having all kinds of fun on the program. Uh, diagnosing Carl, Mar- Karl Marx, Moses Mard- Mordecai, Marx Levy, uh, exposing a little bit of Saul Alinsky and how their ideologies are actually uh, being uh, implemented, frankly, uh, in today's climate. A lot of the things that are happening today are directly connected to the things that they've espoused. Uh, but nevertheless, God remains on the throne. Let me encourage you, as I always do, uh, to remember to serve. Our, let's serve our families well. Let's not allow ourselves to be so consumed in what's happening all around us that we end up neglecting our families. And and just as an aside, I, I want to encourage uh, the brothers, the men who are listening, the husbands who are listening. Man, still court your wife. Still pursue your wife. I know sometimes. And, and I'm not trying to come off like I'm some big marital expert. I've been been married. My wife and I will have been married uh, 12 years uh, this year when our anniversary rolls around. Uh, but I want to encourage you to still pursue your wife, court your wife. Let her know uh, that you still find her uh, just as pursuable as you always have. Um, it's very easy to allow the cares of life to get in the way, even it, especially if you have young children in the home. It's easy to allow to allow serving them uh, to become a priority. I want to simply encourage you uh, to court your wife, brothers. Let her know, let her know that you are still uh, pursuing her. All right, praise God. Well, we're gonna begin the program as we always do, turning to the word of God. Today, we're gonna start in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, the key verses we're going to discuss are verses 26 through 38. But I'm going to have to read uh, starting at about verse 13 uh, just to kind of set up and provide the accurate context for the main portions of the scripture that we're going to focus on today. This is what I would argue a a treatise provided for us in scripture on apologetics where the Apostle Paul uh, is in Pamphylia. Perga is the city uh, particularly. Uh, The Bible tells us that after uh, Paul and his companions set sail from um, Paphos. Paphos is a city on the Greek island of Cyprus. They moved from Paphos on the Greek island of Cyprus on over to Perga, which is located in Pamphylia at the time. And the Apostle Paul and his ministerial team, they happened to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath uh, for the Sabbath the gathering of the Jews there. And as the scripture says, how about I just read it? It's amazing how this all transpires. Uh, But this is Acts chapter 13. I'm going to start in verse 13 reading. uh, But the main text today is going to be verses 26 through 38. And Acts 13, verse 13, the Bible says this. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. So I, I did, in my explanation, I, I left off that last part. So after they went from Paphos, they went to Perga and Pamphylia. Then they went on to Pisidian Antioch, which is not to be confused with Antioch, which is located in the modern day Syria, uh, where uh, the, the Bible says that uh, the spirit of God said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work I've called them to. That is in Antioch, which is, which is in modern day Syria. This Pisidian Antioch is on is 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 closer is more western than that area. All right, uh, due west geographically. So getting back to it, verse fourteen, I read it again. But when they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia, I'm sorry. But when they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia, 
And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Verse 15, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. Now I have to pause for a moment because s gatherings of the Jews in the synagogue uh, usually focus the center of the uh, Sabbath worship, if you will, of the Jews. It's centered around the reading of the Hebrew scripture. So when the Bible says after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, Paul and his team, saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. That is remarkable because you have the leaders of the synagogue recognizing who Paul and his 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 companions are and says that, listen, we recognize that you guys are Hebrew. You are Jews just like us. Um, we recognize at a minimum, they recognize that God is doing something in them and through them. And so after the law and the prophets were read on this particular Sabbath day, the synagogue leaders turn to Paul and say, hey, if you guys have anything you want to say, any word of encouragement, come on in. Let us have it. Then look what happens in verse 16. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. <laughs> they, they gave Paul the microphone. Do they realize what they're doing? They realize it's the same Paul who preached all night that Eutychus fall out of the window. <laughs> so they gave Paul the audience. They gave Paul the platform to speak. And he begins to offer an apologetic defense for the truth that Yeshua is the Messiah. But he starts by going through Israel's history. He goes through Israel's history and providing a foundation for the theological a defense for Jesus as a Messiah, which is an, which as an aside, <laughs> proper understanding of history is vital. It's absolutely critical. We may get into some of that later on in the program, but I'm going to pick up right at verse 26, because this is a part of Paul's apologetic defense. When he says this verse 26, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. <laughs> you got that? I'll read it again. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God to us has been given the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers. Because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, <laughs> they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second song. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's quoted from Psalm 2, 7. All right, verse 34. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. That's quoted from Isaiah 55 verse three. Then look at verse 35. Therefore, he says also in another Psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. That's quoted from Psalm 16 verse 10. All right, look at verse 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. That's verse 39 where I'm concluding there. 
Now, clearly, Paul is laying it out, uses history, uh, quotes from the prophets, the law and the prophets, that he says, you guys, we read this every Sabbath, not recognizing that in Christ, that the law and the prophets were fulfilled. And he goes on to say, <laughs> when the psalmist says, you will not let your Holy One see corruption, he wasn't talking about David, because David saw corruption, he died, but Jesus didn't die. But the thing I want to focus on is when uh, Paul makes the observation in verse 36, for David after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. My pastor in New Orleans, Pastor Wooten, a long time ago, uh, when I was growing up, he preached a message about titled Your Finest Hour. And he referred to Yabetz. Many of us know him as Jabez. And here you have a man who lived a life uh, that the Lord saw fit only to highlight one portion of his life in Scripture. It highlighted um, his, his, his character, his honorability, when the scripture says he was more honorable than his brothers, uh, it highlights the fact that though he was born in pain, uh, that his family, even his mother didn't have great expectations for him, but nevertheless, he was honorable, which is a, a note, uh, uh, to the fact that it doesn't matter what conditions you were conceived or born into, that those conditions are not predictive of what you will be or do or become in your life. And no matter what the circumstances are, you are not equivalent to your circumstances and you can fulfill God's purpose in your life. Uh, but the point of that sermon and the message was, here you have a man who presumably lived an expansive life, but the Lord only highlighted one moment in his life. One pastor described it as his finest hour. Brothers and sisters, what I want to encourage you with today is that as we are living our lives, you and I cannot determine what our finest hours would be. You and I cannot determine what portions of our lives will it be that God would highlight for the maximum express benefit of another. I'm reminded we talked a few last week, I believe it was, when the Apostle Paul and his team were in Thessalonica. They were only there three weeks, only there three weeks. But the Lord caused it to be such genuine conversion to following, to make followers of the way, uh, that there was able to be established there a fledgling church just following those three work, three weeks of ministry. And the challenge I want to offer us today is, can it be said of us? Can it be said of me? Can it be said of you? Just as Paul said about David, that we have served the purpose of God in our generation. That is what I want to ask today. Will it be able to be said of you and I that we have served God's purpose in our generation? The simple rhetorical question, what are we living for? What are we living for? One of the most uh, ripe places with potential, I learned this from Elder Ed in New Orleans, is the graveyard. How many people go to the grave filled with potential that's never realized? How many of us uh, live our days and spend our days and don't have the fullness of what God would have for us to be and to live? We don't have that maximized. And I'm not talking about some maximization for personal consumption. I'm talking about being poured out like drink offerings in service to the Lord's purpose in our generations. Yes, I see the things that are happening around us. Yes, I see the converse. I hear the conversations. I, I see the, the lies and the scandal. Yes, I'm aware of the unsealing of the just stomach churning. Uh, incidents surrounding Jeffrey Epstein in the case in New York. I see all of that. And yes, it is despicable. Despicable. But I don't want to allow that to rob me and to deprive me of serving God's purpose in my generation. You know, my desire for myself, and I would encourage you to adopt the same desire, is that when we meet the Lord, before the Bema seat, that we meet him having been poured out. That we stand before our Lord and the Lord is able to say to us, everything that I've ordained for you to function as a vessel for my honor for, it has been accomplished in your generation. That, brothers and sisters, is what I believe we should be living for. We should be living for the well done not simply to receive accolades, but because is not our God worthy of that? Having purchased our salvation by donning an earth suit and suffering at the hands of unregenerate men, 
I would argue that he is worthy of it for us to move away from giving offerings to becoming the offerings. Like no other nation, Americans have lived under the blessing of prosperity and liberty. These gifts are part of the heritage of a country grounded in the truths of Scripture and given by God to advance the gospel at home and abroad. In these days of moral and spiritual confusion, maintaining the freedom to express our faith in the public square has never been more important. The American Family Association, working to preserve religious liberty for generations to come. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here at American Family Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, it is distinct honor and pleasure to have on the program with me uh, a champion of liberty, a giant in the United States of America, in my view. Uh, my guest right now is Mr. Bob Woodson, the founder and director of the Woodson Center, as well as a former civil rights activist, uh, former senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and also the founder of the 1776 Unites campaign. And you definitely want to stick around because you need to. You don't just want to. You need to know everything that God is doing through this champion in our nation. Mr. Woodson, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. Really pleased to be here. Well, as I said, the pleasure is certainly all mine. I want to start right there. Um, in, in 1981, you founded an organization uh, the name of the organization is the Woodson Center. Would you please describe for the audience uh, what the Woodson Center is and what you guys do through your organization? The Woodson Center is a national not-for-profit organization headquartered in Washington, D.C., and our mission is to go into high-crime, low-income neighborhoods and look for solutions from within that community. If we say that 70% of the families living in black neighborhoods, for example, are raising children uh, that are dropping out of school in jail and drugs. It means 30 percent are not. But mm. nobody goes in and asks, looking for strengths. Uh, and so we go in and find out what's happening among the 30 percent of people who are achieving against the odds, and what is it that we can learn from them that we can apply uh, to the 70 percent. Uh, and so we have had. Uh, and, and so what we do, we find that these are grassroots. What we call Josephs in there and uh and so when when we find for instance they're able to uh, uh help 50 children in a community we get and come in and provide tra training and technical assistance we help them raise some money so they can take the blessings that they've been to 50 and expand it to 500 and so over the course of the last 38 years uh we have been able to go into some of the most drug-infested, crime-ridden neighborhoods and inspire indigenous leadership to uh, come in and transform those individuals and then take over whole communities. Some of our successful efforts have been on 60 Minutes, um, not just one or two, uh, but, but we, we have trained about 2,500 grassroots leaders of all races and groups in 39 states to come up with solutions from within that community to poverty and to despair. And, and learning about your organization, man, it, it was a breath of fresh air uh, because one thing that you noted is, is unfortunately somewhat novel in that your approach is to, as you enter these communities, you utilize the people in the community to offer the solutions as opposed to uh, exter as opposed to imposing on the communities uh, some externalized source of, of solution to respond to those issues. How did you arrive at that approach and what led you to take that approach? Well, I'm a, as I said, I was a young civil rights worker uh, in, the, in, in the mid 60s having led demonstrations. And uh, I became really disenchanted because uh, we, mm. for instance, led demonstrations outside of a pharmaceutical company. And when they desegregated, they hired nine black PhD chemists. And when we asked these brothers and sisters to join us, they said they got these jobs because they were qualified, not because of what we did. And I realized a huge class division. And so mm. that happened two or three times, and I realized that I was in the wrong struggle, that a lot of the mm. people who sacrificed most for, for civil rights did not benefit from the change. 
Dr. King said, what good does it do to have the right to eat in a restaurant if you're choosing or to live in a neighborhood of your choice if you don't have the means to exercise that right? And so it's not enough to open the doors of opportunity if people are unprepared to walk through that doors of opportunity. So the civil rights movement never concentrated its efforts in preparing low-income blacks to walk through that door. Instead, a lot of middle-class, college-educated blacks did, and they took positions as mayors and cities and running through the school boards. And, and, but they left behind low-income blacks. And so I left the movement over that issue and also forced busing for integration because I don't believe the opposite of, 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 of segregation is integration. I think it's desegregation. Mm. Uh, and so that got me in trouble, too, because I don't think anything is all black is all bad. And so I think if you pursue excellence as opposed to integration, integration will be a byproduct of pursuing excellence, like Marva mm. Collins did, uh, a public school teacher in, in uh, Chicago many years ago, opened a, a training academy where she took in kids who were dropping out of public school, and because of the rigor of her, uh, of her classes, uh, low-income kids began to perf- outperform the kids in public school and so that's because she pursued excellence. Um, and so I've been spending my, the rest of my career really uh, going, running national programs where I go all over the country helping low-income people prepare for opportunity. Um, but the, but the, the, and so, so that's, that's kind of what, what the center does. It, it is find solutions from within. But we have spent mm. about twenty-two tr- trillion dollars in the last sixty years on programs to aid the poor. But seventy cents of all those dollars go not to the poor; they go to those who serve the poor, professional <laughs> service providers who, as you say, parachute programs in, and so and only thirty percent to the poor. So we don't ask what solutions are coming from it then, we just want to know not what problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. And that's why and that's we been... have more decline in the last 50 years than we did the pr- previous 50 years. Mm. And, and that's remarkable because when you have, like, like you mentioned, and this is United States of America, $22 mil- trillion dollars poured into solving poverty, poverty and 70 cents on the dollar is going not to the poor, but on the programs who serve the poor, well, in order for the people to continue to get that 70 cents on the dollar, they need their programs to continue. <laughs> so, so they have no incentive to actually resolve the problem if they're generating wealth from the services that are targeted supposedly exactly. to solve That's the problem. That's why <laughs> you've seen this decline in uh, these urban centers. Uh, mm. I mean, uh, black communities, uh, you know, and, and what, what many on the left are saying is that somehow the problems of violence and out of wedlock birth are a direct result of, of slavery and discrimination. Hmm, hmm. And this is just not the case. Slavery and discrimination does not account for, because uh, prior to um, the 60s, for example, between 1930 and 1940, um, when we were in the depression and the unemployment rate in the black community was 40 percent, we had a higher marriage rate than any uh, any other group in the nation. And elderly people walk safely in their community without fear uh, of being assaulted. So, if we were able to uh, uh, be safe and have secure families uh, in 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 the midst of segregation. How can you say that conditions today are worse than they were back then? That, that is a valid point. And how can you say the conditions that are worse now uh, are directly attributable to slavery, that when you go back in time closer to slavery, that you didn't have those problems in the, in the quantities exactly. that you have them now? Even after slavery, uh, there, one of our scholars did some research as to um, what was what was happening in those slave families right after slavery ended, he found that the, the records of six major plantations, six major plantations, seventy five percent of those families had a man and a woman raising children. So we had solid nuclear families even in slavery, 
And that tradition continued for over 100 years mm. until the 1960s, 85% of all black children were raised in two-parent households. And that number has declined since the war on poverty. When, mm. And that just decimated the, 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 the black family in the last 60 years. In other words, for 100 years, we had solid families. Poverty was the largest reduction in poverty occurred between 1940 and 1965. And yet, it, with, it, with, with the presence of all of this funding, $22, it has plateaued over the last 50 to 60 years. Mm. But these, now, are un- listen- these are inconvenient truths that many just don't want to get discussed. So that leads me to a question that's twofold. So listening to you and your emphasis on excellence and and knowing your history as a former civil rights activist, it's pretty apparent that the, the things that you're communicating diverge from many who would say that they trace uh, their history of involvement in, in, in societal engagement to the civil rights era in the 1960s. Um, what caused you? Uh, to diverge in such a way? That's the first part of my question. And then the second part of my question, and as you say that these are inconvenient truths, uh, who the truths are inconvenient to whom, and why are they inconvenient? Well, the, first of all, the truth is inconvenient to those who profit from the exist, existing confusion. Mm. In other words, we have made a commodity out of the poor. And so if your job and your career and your reputation is dependent upon uh, having people who make the case of racism. In other words, you actually create a situation of poverty that you don't solve it. And then you blame it, just like a lot of the black leaders in the cities are saying, even though they have been running these systems where young, uh, black, poor blacks are failing, rather than address why then, if racism were the problem, why are those cities failing? under black leadership for the past 50 years, if race were the issue. And rather than having to confront that problem, what they say as well as institutional race and systemic racism. But when you ask them, well, what does that mean? Mm. And they can't tell you how systemic racism explains their inability to uh, successfully govern uh, solutions to those problems, because they don't have to Mm. say that. Either they're complicit in what happened, or they or they have to acknowledge that they were never in charge in the first place. Mm. So, so right now, and then they use the police as an extension of that excuse by saying, "Well, the police are an extension of the white supremacy, uh, supremacy and institutional racism," and as a consequence, the police then are being charged. They don't. Uh, they do not enforce the laws vigorously in these high crime neighborhoods, and as a result, violence and crime goes up. Hmm. And, and in other words, those detractors are making are, are creating a problem for which they are saying the, the, the problem is institutional racism, as opposed to in other words, they're helping to create a problem for which they are getting funded to solve. <laughs> so if they are creating a problem which they are being funded to solve, then how likely should the populace, uh, how likely is it for the populace for us to expect that the problems will actually be solved? It won't. If they say that institutional racism, if every white person in America went to Canada and Europe, the violence in the black community would not go down. Mm. The out-of-wedlock births would not decline. Drug addiction would not decline. And so this, it is this, important for us to understand that and, um, and, and, and craft remedies that come from within the community. That's why the problems mm. of black America cannot be solved by, by external. It has to come from internally. And that's mm. what the Woodson Center does. Uh, and and it, I it, love it. Says to, so so, so that's, that's where it is. I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. You were, you were about to say something. You said it says... Yeah, no, this that the problem... So the Whitson Center problem is is the victimizer, i.e., life may have knocked you down, but the victim has to get up. Mm. And, and so we use as a model from the book of uh, Genesis, the story of Joseph, 
and I, I wrote a book called The Triumphs of Joseph, and that's the, the, the principle on which the center operates, that Joseph in, in Genesis, even though he was treated with injustice, sold into slavery by his, his brothers, and, and falsely accused of rape, and then in prison, he went through, endured all of those injustices, but he never became bitter, nor did he lose his faith in God. Mm. And as a consequence, when the Pharaoh could not interpret his dreams, he elevated this 31-year-old uneducated Hebrew inmate. <laughs> Come on. And, and brought him up, and together, uh, Pharaoh had the resources and the power. Joseph had the testimony and, and, and the solutions. Mm. And if it wasn't for the good Pharaoh, we wouldn't know about Joseph, because the good Pharaoh is some powerful person who can dream bad dreams in good times and look at, and reach across race and, and, and ethnic lines and class and seek the truth and, and, and empower the truth. That's what we need today. We need to deracialize race and desegregate poverty. We're mm. never going to, uh, to fill that hole in the soul of this country that is aching and gets expressed in uh, suicide among wealthy white kids in Silicon Valley and homicide among poor kids in the urban centers. They're all sides of the same coin. There's a moral and spiritual free fall. Mm. But we're not going to be able to address that free fall if we have to always confront each other on race. Mm. My guest is We've got to get Mr. race off the table. My guest is Mr. Bob Woodson. You want definitely want to stick around. You don't want to go anywhere. I want to give you this information now. The website for the Woodson Center is woodsoncenter.org. It's woodsoncenter.org. You can follow uh, Mr. Woodson on Twitter, at Bob Woodson. And then you also want to take this down, uh, 1776unites.com. We're going to get into this in this next segment. This is a project that you and everyone you know needs to be aware of. It's a 17, 1776 Unites campaign. You can also follow it on Twitter at 1776 Unites. Mr. Bob Woodson, we're talking solutions. We will not move our country forward if we always are complaining. We need solutions. We live in an ever-changing culture that continues to fall away from its moral foundations. The AFA Journal provides a Christian perspective on current issues that are important to your family. Produced by the American Family Association, this monthly magazine is full of articles and stories about people who are making a difference in their community and around the world. Sign up today and receive a free six-month subscription. Visit afajournal.org or call 1-800-326-4543. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and One Minute Commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. My guest is Mr. Bob Woodson, founder of the Woodson Center. The website there is woodsoncenter.org. Also the founder of the 1776 Unites Campaign. You can follow him on Twitter at Bob Woodson. You can follow the 1776 campaign at 1776 Unites. And you can also go to the website 1776unites.com. I want to pick up right where we left off in the last segment. Mr. Woodson, I know that all across this country, uh, there are schools falling over themselves to welcome what I call uh, revisionist history concerning our, concerning our nation, the United States of America. Uh, this greatest experiment in individual liberty in the history of the world uh, to revise the perception of our nation in the minds and hearts of young people. It's called the 1619 campaign written by Nicole Hannah Jones, uh, primarily organized by her, I should say, and put out by the New York Times. What is the 1619 campaign? The 1619 project. Project. I'm sorry. Was 1619 project. by Nicole Hannah Jones and she recruited a bunch of black journalists to write, she's saying that the birthday of America started not with 1776, the Declaration of Independence, but instead it was uh, 1619, the, the, the time when African slaves arrived here, and therefore 
America should be defined as slavery, and as a consequence, is incurably racist. Racism is in its DNA, and capitalism has profited from slavery. Uh, and therefore, capitalism is to be decried. She also said that um, all whites are therefore complicit in that history, and therefore the, they are, should be punished by offering reparations, and that all blacks in this country are victims to be compensated. And that's mm. it. And so what we, and that the problems facing urban America, black urban America today, out of wedlock births, violence, is directly attributed to uh, the shadow of slavery in Jim Crow. So what we did at the Woodson Center is we assembled a group since they are using race as a bludgeon to undermine the values and institutions in America. We wanted to take a similar messenger. So most of the scholars and activists are black, but we've included others. It's kind of like the same profile of the Civil Rights Coalition, led by blacks, but participated in by everybody. And so what we're offering is not a counter-debate. We're offering essays in evidence that goes back into uh, the history of black America and shows that when we were denied access to hotels, we built our own. Mm. We had the Wallahaji in Atlanta, the Carver and Calvert Hotels in Miami, Florida, the St. Teresa in New York, the St. Charles in uh, Chicago. In Chicago alone, in 1929, for example, we had 731 black-owned businesses, 100 million in real estate assets. In other words, we had black Wall Streets all over the country, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the, the Greenwood section in 1920, before it was destroyed with a, by riots mm. and a fire. We had such a prosperous community. Five black men owned their own private airplanes back in 1920. Mm -hmm. We had uh, theaters where there were vaudeville shows with orchestra pits. But, but 1619 ignores all of this rich history of how blacks, in the face of discrimination, was is defined not as a victim, but how we prospered and achieved against the odds. I'm not denying that we, we, we need to tell the truth about slavery, but slavery is America's birth defect. America is defined not just by a birth defect, by, but by the promise uh, of what we had 20 blacks who were born slaves who died millionaires. Two of them went back mm. and purchased a plantation on which they were slaves. So, but our young people, black and white, they need to know the accurate history. Have only in, yeah. in America is the only nation on the face of the earth that ever fought a war to end slavery. It is the yeah. only nation that has an Emancipation Proclamation. That's yeah. why people of all colors are risking their lives to get here. But it's all of what we, what we, uh, men have lived and died for is being undermined by the left that has co-opted the civil rights movement and used America's birth defect as a bludgeon against this country. And now they're promoting anarchy with these, with these riots using, uh, George Floyd's death as a means of, of and, and taking these over and destroying our institutions uh, intellectually, they're dumbing down uh, even the um, Civil Rights Museum on the Smithsonian mm. uh, had to withdraw a statement where they're saying that such uh, values as hard work, self-sacrifice, respect for authority are all white. That's when you're being yeah. white, when you work hard, show up on time, obey the law, uh, delay gratification, you're being white. Can you imagine how dangerous and corrosive such an attitude is on yes. kids in the urban centers trying to struggle in those communities to say to them 
that they are exempt from any personal responsibility because of the America's racial past, that is the most dangerous. That's even worse than slavery, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Slavery and bigotry is external. Treason mm. and traitors are internal. So I just think what we are confronting is much worse than what we had to confront during the time of Jim Crow. Because mm. now they are convincing a lot of blacks that their faith is in the hands of of somebody that they said hates them. And, and that, that's just, that, that is perpetual paralysis. That's infantilizing an entire group of people. And to assert that things like, you know, white supremacy and slavery are in America's DNA, that, that communicates that it's, it's perpetual and irreversible. The things in your DNA, you never can change. Even if you have that's external surgeries, and, and, and that's exact, that is the point. So if, if that's the point, <laughs> then what, why try? If that if that if if it's irreversible, why try? And that is, as you're saying, the goal of what they're trying to communicate. But you, instead of uh, allowing the editorialization of America's history through the 1619 project to stand, that you are offering the 1776 Unites campaign that has a full throated, uh, I, I would argue, a, f a front that would be able to protect the American populace from the cancerous ideas from the 1619 Project, how are you going about doing that? Is it through stories, well, we, narratives, we're, writings? We're moving on all fronts. We're developing K-12 through curriculum out of our essays. Mm. We are also developing training guides. We're going to have videos that's going to celebrate how uh, we achieved against the odds. We're, we're having um, a, 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 a campaign to train grassroots leaders so they can be civic teachers uh, with even developing a fictional comic character uh, called mm. Ben 1776 uh, mm. that we hope will be popularized. So we, we believe that we must have a, an all-out campaign that is not just an intellectual essays, but also the most powerful way to demonstrate the value of American uh, virtues is our activists. These are, are, are people whose lives, they were, some of them were gang members, some of them were drug addicts, some of them, but, but, but through God's grace, they have been transformed and redeemed. And nothing is more powerful in convincing people the value of virtues when you see it in action, when someone can say, this is what I used to be, mm. and now this is who I am today. So... Is, is nothing is more powerful than a witness. Mm. And so that's what we're going to do. And I always say when, when the um, servants of John the Baptist came to Jesus and said, are you the one, or should we seek another? Jesus didn't offer an argument or proof. He just healed in their presence and said, go tell him what you saw. Mm. If we're going to win this cultural war, that's what we've got to say to the American public. Come let us show you what happens when these values are embraced by a broken person? Mm. Let me introduce you to a person who has been redeemed. Let them tell you the pathway toward that redemption. And what were the values that guided them on their journey? This is what we've got to do. Mm. It's amazing. Uh, you referred to the Smithsonian's offering then their retraction of their diagnoses of positive characteristics as being indicative of, quote unquote, whiteness. I mean, things like objective linear reasoning and delayed gratification. <laughs> you know, he immediately made me think that you just canceled out, you know, people like George Washington Carver, Benjamin Banneker or people like Biddy Mason. Uh, that, that, that these are the types of people that all of the American populace need needs need to know. Um, would, would you share with the audience a little bit about Biddy Mason's story and, and, and how yeah, we, in the face of great difficulty? Yeah, Biddy Mason was a fascinating woman. She was born 1818 in Mississippi as a slave. And um, she had three babies, one by the slave master. And when he was a Mormon, so he moved from Mississippi to uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, and for over six or seven months, she had to walk behind the wagon uh, delivering babies and caring for sheep. 
And when they got to Salt Lake City soon after, they moved down to then what is now Los Angeles. And when she got there, again, she was behind a wagon. They discovered from other free blacks that California was a free state. So she became free, and she um, lived with a small group of free uh, slaves. And she started uh, to, again, the midwife delivered babies, made a dollar and 25 cents a day. And uh, she saved her money for 10 years and purchased some land downtown Los Angeles before it was what it is now and built some properties there and then rented them out. And then from there became a very prosperous and wealthy uh, real estate uh, uh, person. She founded the AME church there. She became a philanthropist when floods came. She went to the local store and told the people that they didn't have to, to build her. When Biddy Mason died, uh, she had three daughters, and they married other three blacks. She was worth the equivalent of $650,000, which would be about $6 million in today's dollars. Mm. Biddy Mason walked over mm. a 1,000 miles plus, illiterate, couldn't read or write, had three mm. babies, and yet she prospered in the face of of those horrendous odds. And uh, she is, is one of the people that we should be celebrating and teaching our children uh, perseverance, uh, tenacity, um, grit, determination. Mm. She and hundreds of others like her, uh, their story should be told and their behavior and value should be emulated and uh, their success should be celebrated. Mm, I agree. I agree. A hundred and fifty thousand million percent, if that's even a number. Um, you, you, you mentioned earlier about the reality uh, that though most of us today we know about Greenwood. No, not most of us don't know that. I'll say this. <laughs> uh, some of us know about Greenwood, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma as a black Wall Street. Uh, but the reality is there were black Wall Streets all over the country. All over uh, the but country. We, where are some of the locations of some of those Black Wall Streets all over the country and the time periods, if you can recall? With 1929, we had the, uh, uh, um, uh, in Chicago, South Side, uh, the, the biggest one was Durham, the Haytide section of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, oh. It had an, um, about 100 businesses, even during the Depression, uh, they did not uh, lose a single business in Durham. Just to show you how clever they are, the first company in the country to manufacture nylon stocking was a black-owned company in Durham. But because of segregation, uh, they hired an all-white sale, national sales force and was able to sell their stockings all over the country. Wow. Because <laughs> that was their wow. way to conceal the fact that they were black owned. They had all white mm. sales to sell mm. to the country. Uh, and uh, Durham, and, and then we, we had uh, various towns in Oklahoma uh, that sprung up. Uh, um, and, and so uh, it's, it's, it's just Philadelphia was a prosperous, uh, Boston, all over the country we had uh, small business sections. One real estate company in New York City, Harlem, had over 200 employees in 1929. Wow. And folks, this is this is our history. This is the history of the United States of America that we all need to know and understand. And these are some of the things that will enable us to fight against the editorialization and the attempts to castigate America based on an, if, an instance in history as opposed to being able to point to the fact that America is the greatest experiment in individual liberty and that anybody in America, if you would work hard and apply the universal values that are founded most specifically in scripture, that we all can thrive and succeed. Thank you, Mr. Woodson, for being on the program today. And thank you for having me. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.